Uh, welcome to our webinar. I would like to introduce you Dr. Gabriel Goldman. Gabriel has been appointed president of the Uruguayan Friends of the Hebrew University in November 2013 and has been elected member of the Hebrew University Board, board of the Governors in 2014 and again in 2017 unanimously. A Montevideo native, Gabriel is a lawyer, having studied both at the Hebrew University and at the Tel Aviv University, and is the director of the founding partner of Global Investments in Uruguay. Gabriel speaks also fluent Hebrew and is an active member of local Jewish community organizations. Before I leave the stage to Gabriel, I would like to remind to all of you that you are welcome to ask questions to Shirley by raising your digital hand or by writing in the question and answer box. I also would like to remind you that you will receive the recording of the webinar next week. So Gabriel, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Shalom, everybody. Thank you, Mara, for your kind words. Uh, it is incredible how time flies. In a few months, I will complete eight years presiding the Uruguayan Friends of the Hebrew University in Montevideo. Lots of great experiences collected since I joined the cause of this great institution. Both here hosting conferences of HU's professors and researchers and organizing the local campaign. And in Jerusalem, every year the Board of Governors, amazed by the Hebrew University's innovations and networking with the finest people of around the world. I feel proud every time people in Uruguay look at us as Hebrew University representatives with admiration and thanks for our achievements. Let me share with you a memory which I especially treasure. That night in June 2013, when the Hebrew University hosted the then president of the State of Israel, Shimon Peres 19th birthday in Binyane Umay in Jerusalem. La creme de la creme of the world gathered them from Bill Clinton and Tony Blair to Robert De Niro and Sharon Stone, Sharon Stone. Mrs. Barbara Streisand sang happy birthday to the president and Shlomo Artsy performed his famous Ahavtia song. And it was only my first year with the HU. However, my relationship with the Hebrew University did not start in 2012. I clearly remember that cold winter of 1979 when I fly to Israel from Uruguay to study the Mechina in the Hebrew University in Mount Scopus and resided in the Resnick dorms. The excellence of these classes enabled me to apply and to be admitted to law school in the sister Tel Aviv University and to eventually get my degree and be a member of the Israel Bar Association in 1984. Having achieved those academic and professional goals, I volunteered to be a prosecutor at the Military Advocate General's Corps of the IDF, Tzahal, where I served for four and a half years. The present Attorney General of Israel, Avichai Mandelblit, was also a legal counselor in the IDF at the same time with me. Back in Uruguay, I also had the honor to be the president of the local Karen Kayemet Israel from 2003 to 2008, in the same manner that my late father, Itzhak Goldman, Zichrono Libracha, did in the 60s here in Montevideo. Well, enough about me. Let us proceed with the reason of our Zoom today. Professor Shirley Werner is associate professor and a senior lecturer at the Paul Berwood School of Social Work and Social Welfare at the Hebrew University. Her specialty, specialty lies in researching how society treats individuals with intellectual and development disabilities. Her studies focus on attitudes and stigma towards them and guardianship and services for them. I kindly invite Professor Werner to enlighten us with her webinar, Parents, of children with and without disabilities in Corona times. Preliminary findings. Shirley Bebakasha. Thank you very much, Gabriel, for the nice introduction. Uh, it's nice to hear a bit about you because I'm not certain of who is exactly in front of me or who are the people that I'm speaking with. So uh, Mara suggested that your Hebrew is fluent and I have a bit of a Spanish so we can also deal with all the languages together. Uh, I will try to share my uh, slides and then we will be able to begin this presentation. Um, I want to say, as Mara has suggested, that of course you can raise your hand at any time you have a question. 
Um, I might be a bit into my talk, so if I don't, if I miss your hand, um, because I have my PowerPoint presentation up, uh, I would appreciate Mara if you can let me know, and I can stop at any time for any questions uh, that you might have. Um, sure. So, uh, okay, I'm beginning. Sure. Thank you. So uh, as Gabriel and Mara said, my name is uh, Shirley Werner. I am the head of the MSW program at the School of Social Work and Social Welfare. And I am also a member of the Center for Disability Studies that is located in our school uh, together with JDC Israel. Uh, in this specific presentation, I'm going to talk to uh, you about a burden and growth during COVID-19. And I'm trying to compare parents of children with and parents of children without disabilities in Israel. As you might imagine, because it's uh, during COVID-19, uh, this study is really brand new and I'm bringing it to you uh, preliminary uh, findings from the study that we have just finished conducting. Uh, I come to this study from two perspectives. Uh, one is my professional hat as a researcher, and all of my research throughout the years has always been in the disabilities field. But the other hat that I bring with me to this research is as a mother of, of uh, three children, uh, one of whom has a disability. So she's always part of me and always part of any research I do. But specifically in this time, she was very much part of me. Uh, and you will see why uh, when I describe the situation that parents of children with disabilities face, especially during COVID-19. So I invite all of you to take your uh, professional and your uh, personal hat. And if you're parents to children or parents to children with disabilities, try to keep in the back of your mind the experiences that you had in these past few weeks of COVID-19. Um, so for those of you who are not from Israel, I want to give a bit of, an of a background of what was happening in Israel during this time, and it might be similar to what have you experienced in the various countries. Um, so Israel was very uh, fast to realize the health threat of COVID-19 and was very fact fast to act on the health front. So some of the things that Israel did quite quickly was, of course, social distancing. We all know this term from the beginning. Uh, very quickly, Israel placed a mandatory 14-day quarantine for any individual who was coming from infected countries and quickly afterwards to actually anyone arriving from aboard. Uh, there were limitations to gatherings. They were first closed to only about 100 people for gathering. Afterwards, they were lowered down and only 10 people were allowed to take place together in gatherings. Everything was particularly closed down. It was coffee malls and shopping places, but also schools, of course, and special, special education schools were closed down at this time. There were restrictions to how far one can leave the house, and this was limited to 100 meters away from the home. And especially over the holiday season, there was a full lockdown, and people could actually not leave their homes at all. So while Israel was really, I think, very successful on this health front, there was a lot of criticism coming from citizens regarding the financial costs of this uh, closure. And also on the educational front, giving school closure, schools were instructed to move to distance learning, but they weren't really given any um, guidelines of how to implement this. And every school did something differently as they saw appropriate for this time. So all this time, of course, is stressful for anyone, but I want to argue that this was especially stressful. I know this from the literature, I know this from my personal life in this past couple of months, especially stressful for uh, families with young children, being locked down with children in the home for 24 hours a day, receiving conflicting information from the media that was many times a cause for stress for individuals, fear of the unknown, 
uh, many people that have lost their employment across this time, many people that had to work from home and at the same time work and be with their children, disruption of uh, the social networks. So, so this was a very, very uh, stressful and maybe it still is a bit of a stressful period of time. On the other hand, we know from a literature in the, st in the stress field and literature that has to do with trauma, that many times situations that are stressful and situations of trauma can actually lead some people to what we call, or positive psychology calls, post-traumatic growth. And this describes individuals who not only survive the time of stress and crisis, but actually experience important and profound changes and find new meaning in life while dealing with these situations. So based on this uh, background, we decided to set out in a study during the peak time that all of us were locked in the home to examine what might determine and growth among these uh, families. And we also wanted to see if burden and growth might be different between parents who have children with disabilities and parents who do not have children with disabilities. And we decided to examine specifically four determinants of burden and growth. The first one is called family cohesion and family adaptability. Uh, by cohesion, we mean the emotional bonding between family members inside the home. And by adaptability, we mean how families are able to remain flexible and, re and uh, react to each other in this stressful situation and to the different needs of family members. The second determinant is parent-child interactions. What happens between the parents and their children? How do they interact with one another? And specifically, we looked at two forms of interactions. One of them is known as reciprocity. And reciprocity describes the way that the interaction between the parent and the child is one which allows uh, the parent to accommodate for the wishes and the needs and the requests of their children. The second form of interaction is protection and security, but this is a positive meaning of protection. This is the way in which the parent can look out for a child who might be distressed and try to uh, provide protection and safety in the way that alleviates the distress of the child. The third source that we looked at was the informal social support. We wanted to see what types of social supports parents had during this time, what was available to them, who were the close people that were available to the parents. And we know from different research that this can help support individual and build their resilience. The fourth factor that we looked at was the adequacy of educational services. And this comes quite naturally just because of the stressful time and the fact that the main place that, cut, that shut down and closed up were the schools. So we wanted to see how the families perceived the school system as being adequate to meet the needs of their children. And we also want to look at this by looking specifically at families of children with disabilities. And I want to argue that even though these times were stressful for all individuals and all families, families of children with disabilities are especially vulnerable at these times and take really a very, dis they take more a uh, burden upon themselves in this time. And this is because children with disabilities might have an exacerbation of their symptoms at this time. This is because a lot of children with disabilities have difficulties with change of routine and with losing support. And they also lost uh, meeting their friends, uh, getting the various power professional services that they need. So there really was a lot of things that these p uh, children lost, as well as having great difficulties with distance learning that was not always or was actually not very much um, meeting the needs of the children with disabilities. 
So we set out on a mixed method studies, and this was between the week of April 21st and April 30th, just the end of this past month. And it was at the peak of when restrictions were still at their high peak in Israel. Afterwards, they were uh, taken away. Participants in the study were 680 parents. Most of them were mothers of children between the ages of one and 15. Of these parents, about 100 of them also told us that they had a child with a disability. And this allows us to have a comparison group of parents with and parents without disabilities. I'll tell you a bit about the methodology. And if anything is not clear, of course, you can stop me and ask these questions. What did we measure? We wanted to measure two outcome variables. So one of them was burden. The parents were asked, when you compare yourself to other families, to what extent do you feel that the current crisis imposes a burden on you more than on other families? So it was one outcome variable. And the second outcome variable was post-traumatic uh, growth. And here we used eight items from an inventory that examined this uh, construct of post-traumatic growth. For example, I am able to do better things with my life. These are items that have to do with added meaning gained by parents at this time. In terms of the determinants that we examined at this time, these were four main determinants. The first is family cohesion and adaptability. There were 10 items and I provide an example. For example, family members ask each other for help, which shows that they're uh, bonding together, the family members. Parent and child interactions, as I said before, we measured two different types of interactions. One is reciprocity, this mutual relationship between the parents. For example, I know my child's preferences and I take them into concern when we plan our family's activities. And the other one was the ability of the parents to protect or secure their child. When my child is sad, I know how to make him feel that I understand him and support him. And all of these questions related and not general parenting, but specifically during the time of Corona when we were closed down with the families at home. Social support, to what extent did the parent use support from the various sources that are listed here? The spouse, the grandparents, babysitters, neighbors, or one of the children, to what extent they were able to use their support during this time? And the final part was how did they perceive that the school system was adequate for the needs of their specific child and for their specific learning needs? Together with these variables, we also asked the parents to answer some open questions. For example, how is your relationship with your child similar or different to what was before Corona time? And what are your challenges and how do you deal with the challenges during these times? And we were actually quite surprised that we were able in about a week to have 680 parents answer a, our questionnaire and really go very deeply into their experiences also in these open questions. So you will see in the results that I'm about to uh, show you that I will give you both results that have to do with the questionnaire as well as results that come from the open questions in our study. So I, I'm not sure how you are with numbers, so don't get scared from the numbers and look specifically at the circles that are circled within the slides. What we can see from these circles are a couple of things. If we look at numbers that are from one to five, we see that parents reported both burden and growth about the same degree of burden and growth that parents are reporting. So this goes to show us that burden and growth are not separate or not mutually exclusive. A parent can feel burdened and can also feel at the same time that they're gaining some uh, meaning and growth in their life. The other thing this slide shows was not surprisingly, parents children with disabilities uh, told us that they had a lot more burden than parents of children without disabilities. 
So these are some of the things that parents told us that really go to show how much burden they felt. The greatest challenge is to leave all of us together in the home, each one with their challenges, difficulties, wishes, and to provide for the needs of all. It is difficult to function, especially as there is a need to also work from home. The degree of daily functioning that is needed for me is very high. So these were some of the things that came just from a few of the parents and suggest really the high amount of burden that they faced at this time. But there were also quotes that showed us that at the same time that they were feeling burden, they were also feeling that they're gaining some meaning and growth in their life. For example, this one mother tells us, during all of these difficult times, I learned to cope because I'm a strong woman and I know to take the most difficult things in my life with love and a strong belief that God will always send me the strength and power. So both burden and growth can live together. And this is a good thing, of course, for these parents. The other thing that we see is really moderate and even a bit high levels of cohesion and adaptability. We also see a quite positive relationships between the parents, positive on both the reciprocity scale and also positive on the protection security scale. But also here, we do see a difference between the parents and parents of children with disabilities reported lower rating of being able to provide protection and security for their child with a disability. And I do want to provide a quote that gives an example of this. The challenge of raising him, her child with a disability, is even bigger now. The autistic symptoms are sharper and this influences the way I see him in comparison to pre-corona time and in comparison to my other children. It has become difficult for me to contain him and let him be who he is. This causes me an emotional distance between us and negative feelings. So she's talking about the symptoms of her child with autism that are getting more severe during this time of lockdown and being together in the home. And it is difficult for her many times to provide protection for her child or provide him with the feeling of how he might lower these feelings of distress that he has. The third type of finding that I want to show you here has to do with the sources of support that the parents have. Not surprisingly, the most leading source for support for parents was the spouse. So there was quite a lot of support coming from the spouse. There was some support coming from an additional child in the home, but there was merely no support from grandparents, from baby, babysitters or neighbors. And this was clearly because no one was able to come in and come out and the parents were losing a lot of the uh, social networks that they had from before and were not able to access these social networks at this time. And parents made a lot of comments to this lack of support that they had at this time. Our entire support system collapsed. Help from grandparents and close family member no longer exists. All of my son's care, care settings, hobbies, clubs, clubs, everything has stopped working. We're left alone. So the parents really lost every type of help that they previously had. This has to do with the informal support, but this also has to do with all of the services that they had previously had even emotional support for the child was not present anymore. The other thing that I have down here below was the adequacy of the educational services. And this is an important point that comes across. We see that really all parents provided quite low ranking to the adequacy of the educational services but parents of children with disabilities were much lower down compared to parents of children without disabilities. And here are some things these parents told us. Children with special needs had no answer. There was no school and no therapy. Distance learning is a challenge for children with special needs. Absolute dysfunctionality of the educational system 
I want to say that these are just a few pickings. These types of quotes came from most, if not all of the parents that completed the questionnaire. So this was something that was repeating again and again. But it was not only that the parents were losing out on the academic front and not getting a specific learning needs for their kids, but because the school provides a social needs of the child, the school provides most of the times the power professional care that the child needs. So the child was losing out on all of these fronts. And these parents were telling us, this girl since Purim is locked at home. She has no communication at all with children her age. And another mother was saying, it was most difficult to juggle between being a parent, a teacher, a physiotherapist, an occupational therapist, a speech therapist, and at the same time to work and to also take care of the ongoing tasks at home. So the parents had to replace all of the different things that the school had provided with before. Some of them were able to accommodate for this. For some of them, this was, of course, a lot more difficult to do. We next looked at the relationship between all of these determinants and burden and growth. And we see, not surprisingly, that cohesion and adaptability, reciprocity, protection, and the adequacy of the educational services were all negatively correlated with, with burden. So the more you have of these resources, the less burden that you feel. And the more you have of these resources, the more growth that you feel. We also see that the more support the parents had from a child, they also experienced more growth. But one surprising finding that you might see here, and I will get back to this finding in a couple of slides, was that more support from a spouse the more support one receives from a spouse, the greater burden that they feel and less growth that they feel. So this is a little bit opposite from what we thought we might find. And we have a bit of an explanation for this and we might try to find other explanations as well. We wanted to see if the relationship between each one of these determinants and the burden and growth might look different for parents who have a child with a disability and for parents who do not have a child with a disability. So what you see in front of you right now is the relationship between family cohesion and burden and growth. When the blue line is a parent of a child without a disability and the orange line is for parents of a child with a disability. So while we see that for parents uh, who do not have a child with a disability, more cohesion meant less burden and more growth, for parents that had a child with a disability, more cohesion inside the family was actually related to more burden inside the family. So at first we think this is quite surprising but of course, we go down into the quotes that parents provide us and they themselves provide an explanation for this. So one mother has says, not much has changed in the pattern of our relationship, just the intensity and frequency which challenges my ability to cope in a constructive manner. I am prone to greater irritability and fatigue. But on the other hand, I have more free time to spend with them, with her children, and make up for it in some way. So that she describes a situation of cohesiveness inside the family, of being able to spend time together, but along with this of being really burdened and irritable at the same time. The other thing that we have, which we also found to be what we thought was quite surprising, but you'll see in a bit, a, if we're able to provide some type of a, an explanation for this, looks at the relationship between how much help does one have from their spouse and again, burden and growth. So just like with the other slide, 
uh, the blue line looks at parents of children without a disability and the orange line looks at parents of children with disabilities. And what we see when we look at the blue line was that more uh, help from a spouse was really not related to more burden or more growth. The line looks pretty much horizontal. Nothing much changes in terms of burden and growth for these parents of children. But when we look at the orange line, we see that the more help that a parent had from their spouse, the more burden that they actually feel and the less growth that they feel. I hope this is clear. Is that okay? Okay. I hope I have you with me when I bring out all these drawings and numbers. I certainly hope, but I will also answer questions, of course. Yes, Shirley, we are all here and listening to your very interesting lecture, so you can keep going, and then there will be the questions. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, it's me, always scared when I put up some type of graph. Um, so again, we, first of all, uh, I, I must say that when I analyze the data, I look at numbers because I'm sort of a number person. And I said to myself, I don't understand this. You have more support from your spouse. Clearly you must feel less burden. You have your spouse next to you to help you with this. And I go in and I look deeper down into what the parents had to say to us inside their quotes. And they provide very strong explanations for this. So just one explanation, my spouse, who is the main caregiver for our children because I am working, is very burnt out and I don't have the emotional strength to help him. So this mother is suggesting that her spouse is there, he's beside her, he's providing a lot of support basically because he's needed and there is no other alternative, he has to be there and provide this support. But at the same time, he's burnt out, she's burnt out, and the entire family system is burnt out. So uh, although, uh, as I suggested in the methods part, it wasn't that we asked the parents to provide us, of course, answers to our statistics, but this was just something that was out there very, very clearly from what the parents were telling us. So I'm going to try to uh, bring some of these findings together into a discussion. And again, it is important for me to say uh, that this is really brand new. It hasn't come out any place. It was just this past week that I was playing with the statistics and playing with the quotes of the parents. Um, so along with the discussion that we're going to have when I finish, Maybe you'll also have other thoughts for us because really these are a very beginning thoughts that we're having on this topic. What we see is that COVID-19 uh, of course has its physical impact, but I think more importantly, we must look at the psychological impact that this period of time had on the well-being of individuals, the well-being of these children and the well-being of parents and specifically uh, parents of children with disabilities. So it is very important to look at this. And I think a lot of um, solutions were placed on how we might uh, stop the contamination from the disease, but not a lot of thought was placed, at least not in Israel, on what do we do with these families that are locked down and are paying their price in terms of their emotional and psychological well-being. In terms of burden, of course, we see a differential impact and we see families of children with disabilities reporting a lot of impact and adversity. And we must respond to this, the things that are saying. And in any case, in different emergencies or if we happen to have another outburst of the disease, we really must look at their emotional well-being and try to provide input for them. An additional important though, finding we find here, and I think it's very important, was that growth was also possible and can coexist at the same time. And for some of these families, there was a lot of meaning in their life that was gained. Not that I'm suggesting 
as a parent and as a parent of a child with a disability, you will not hear me say, let this happen again and let me be shut down with my kids again. No, <laughs> but I'm saying that if this happens, we can still learn from this and develop meaning in our life. We do see very clearly the importance of the nuclear family during the pandemic, very clearly because other sources of supports were just not there, but the nuclear family took the front at this time. So we see the importance of cohesion in the family. We see the importance of the parent-child interactions and especially the protection and security that the parents provide to these kids. And naturally, these parents are the backbone of the family and the backbone of com uh, providing comfort for their children during this time. Although we do see that these parents of children with disabilities had more difficulty, and this might be related to the fact that their children are more vulnerable to change in routine and to stress during this time and to really dealing with these situations of adversity. Uh, the other important findings, I think, come from uh, the graphs that I suggested to you, this moderation, and the fact, for example, that greater cohesion uh, for parents of children with disabilities did not bring to more growth, and the fact that greater uh, support from the husband also uh, did not bring for more growth, but actually brought to greater burden, so we're thinking about this and we're thinking about the quotes that the parents told us, but one possibility might be that the uh, spouses just had to be there. What I wrote here was greater support from husband because most of the participants were mothers. But of course, this is a two way thing that was also greater support from the mother at this time. But it might be related to the fact that they really must uh, achieve this support and achieve cohesion in order to be able to deal with the situation. But this was not enough to replace the various other sources of support that were missing at this time. And at some time, this was at the cost of the spouse having to leave work, the spouse having to stay at home because two parents are needed to take care of this family system. And of course, this in and of itself is a source for burden. My final point has to do with schools. Uh, and I think um, the findings that we show here show, of course, that schools are very important, not only because of the academics, but also for the social roles that they complete, the emotional roles, the power of professional care that they provide for students. And it's very sad to say that the schools in Israel, uh, I'm not sure how it was in other parts of the study of uh, the world, but in Israel, schools were very much ill-prepared to deal with the crisis situation, very much ill-prepared with everything that has to do with distance learning for all children. But of course, for children with disabilities, children who might have vision problems and might not be able to see the distance learning, children who do not know how to function a computer, children who are not able to sit across the computer for an entire learning day, None of these things um, found the solutions within the Israeli educational system. And I think it is safe to say that from now on, we really need to plan ahead for the next upcoming, hopefully not to come national emergency and plan the school system uh, differently so that they will be able to provide these types of solutions timely and in a way that meets the needs for all of these children. Uh, so this is the end of my part and I am open to any questions you might have. Thank you very much Shirley. It was really a pleasure to hear and it was really interesting to know the experience of all kinds of parents um, so we are open now. Uh, we open now our question uh, time. If you have any question, you can raise your hand or write it in the question and answer box. All 
Are we able to see Mara, the participants, or? Yes, I think you're able to. I'm seeing just yourself and uh, Gabriel. I uh, know we cannot see the. the oh, okay. okay. The participants can only speak, can only open their microphone. Okay. It's okay, we can wait a few more seconds. Okay, I think if there are no questions right now, um, you are always welcome to write me by mail and uh, ask me any question, just a second, and, uh, um, and I will forward it to, to Shirley. Um, so we have one question from David Stambler. Where will you be taking this study next? Hey, hey David. Uh, so actually we have a lot more uh, data from uh, this study. Um, right now I'm in the process of writing this uh, specific article from these findings, but we were very happy that many of the parents were also willing to, um, to speak with us for in-depth interviews. So we have about 15 interviews very long, lengthy, one hour, one hour and a half interviews that we have with parents sharing with us their experiences. And we will begin to uh, analyze these in-depth interviews. And we also want to look uh, in what I presented to you now, it uh, was mainly things that have to do, of course, with the family and the education system. But the in-depth interviews also go into uh, social services, where were these services at this time, uh, and into looking uh, across, of course, uh, all of their experiences. Many interesting things come out. For example, parents that are telling us some positive things. For example, the school has always told me my child can't do this and can't do this. But I sat with him now two months at home and he can do all of these things that they're always telling me that he cannot do. Uh, so I think we can take this into very different perspective. If any of you are interested, you can follow up with me and I'll be glad to share with you any upcoming uh, uh, results. Okay, um, so we have another question. How do you define disabilities, autism and ADHD, physical disabilities, which is the definition? Okay. Um, I, I see also the questions in front of me, so this is great. Um, we provided them with the ability to, for, a self for two things. First of all, with a self-report, do you have a child with a disability? And then they had the ability to, uh, we asked them what is the main disability? Uh, autism was one of the main disabilities. About half of the parents that we had were parents for autistic children. Uh, there were parents with physical disabilities, parents uh, of children with uh, intellectual disabilities. So it was varied pretty much, but about half were parents of children with autism. Um, should I go on to David? I see. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. Uh, you said that 100 of the total study participant had children with disabilities. How does that percentage uh, compare to actual percentage of Israeli parents of children with disabilities? Uh, in general, uh, percentages in Israel of children with disabilities, uh, but one of you might have to put out a calculator, about 14% uh, in Israel are children that have disabilities. So I think it's about representative, although this is a non-representative sample. We sent it out via Facebook and any place we can reach while we're all locked down. Um, but I think it's about correct uh, proportionality. Okay. And I have Heidi. Uh, congratulations, Shirley, as a grandparent and not able to see my grandchildren and help them out in any way needed. I felt totally isolated. None with the disability or talk analysis 
and delicate presentation was, thank you, Heidi, for the kind word. Uh, the kind words, Heidi, also makes me think. Uh, first of all, I saw my parents only once since the lockdown. My parents are still social distancing themselves from uh, my kids, and my mother had a heart issue just before Corona, so they're still distancing themselves. But you're actually taking me to the grandparents' side because my study looked at the parents and how maybe even some parents might feel that the grandparents are not there but i think a next study might be to look at the grandparents aspect into this and how they felt while they were isolated from their grandchildren and family so you're uh, you're providing with with, with some uh, input for the next study thank you so uh, i think this was our last question again i invite everybody to, to feel free to, to write to me and I will forward uh, your question to Shirley. I also would like to thank Gabriel Goldman for the introduction and uh, thank you to all of you for being with us. And uh, as I said, I will send the recording next week and I will also send our next webinars so that uh, you can sign in. Thank you to everybody. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Barbara, thank you Shirley. Thank you. Nice, very nice webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Bye -bye.